a different place, different period of time for the revolution, should be able to send us a message that we can understand. And the reason I, that I think that's likely is that they live in the same universe as we, they must deal. The reason I, that I think that's likely is that they live in the same universe as we, they must deal with the same laws of physics, of chemistry, and astronomy as we. To test the idea that a signal could be understood, we did a little experiment. We can only use human beings. It's too bad. I wish we could use some other intelligent beings to make such a, uh, an experiment, but we're restricted to people. They're the only ones we know about. And so what we did was to devise a complicated message, which you can see here, of zeros and ones. The zero and one might be a long and a short uh, radio beep, you know, beep, 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 or it might be two frequencies, beep, 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 beep. Um, might be many things, but it's a language of two letters. And you can see there's an enormous number of zeros and ones, in fact, 27,000 and something of them here. You can't tell just by looking at it. Oh my goodness, I see what this is. You have to think about it. Now the key to this is that the total number of zeros and ones is 31 times 31 times 31. 31 cubed. And it suggests that it's a pictorial message in three dimensions. And if we were to write it in a sequence of 31 symbols then go to the next line, then you see it starts getting a remarkable regularity. And so what we did is uh, to give this message, not made simple in that way, uh, to some graduate students of mine at Cornell University. They were told nothing about what was in it, how to decode it, and uh, their job was to figure out what it said. And uh, here they are describing uh, the, uh, the process they went through to figure out what the message was about. These are all graduate students of mine who are reasonably clever. Um, and, uh, but none of them work on this particular problem. And, well, we uh, gathered together in the, the Mars room and stared at it and uh, cursed volubly at length. Kathy noticed that uh, 31 divided into 29,791. <laughs> And uh, it was determined that the remainder, 961, was 31 squared, which left us with a 31 by 31 by 31 sequence. And then we sat together, six of us, for four hours, transcribing zeros and ones, screaming and shouting from one office to the next, and complaining about the typographical errors <laughs> until we could get the sequence, which uh, is shown in frames there. They were making good progress. They found some errors uh, in uh, the transcription of this that the BBC had made, in fact. But uh, they figured out how to get around that. It was not necessarily a three-dimensional model at first. It could have been a movie. Because what we see, what eventually turned out to be the corner markers of the cube and, and the lines which drew the pattern of the cube could have been just frame markers for a movie or a slideshow. It could have been separate frames. And it was only when we had drawn them out and looked at them that it became very uncertain whether it was anything like that. Since it was a dull movie, you figured it was really a three-dimensional movie. That was, that was about the size of it. So, here we have some plexiglass things. So one will be represented by a black um, square and a zero by a transparent square. Uh, here's a whole sequence of... Uh, transparent squares, that is, this would represent a sequence of zeros. Now, building up as the message requires, first space is a one, which is black, second space, another one, which is black, third space, another one, which is black, and in fact, it's black ones all the way across the top line. So, top line there is a sequence of black ones. Next line begins with a black one, but then there's a sequence of zeros represented by the transparent markers, and then a one at the end. Now we have the similar pattern building up, black edge transparent interior, which goes for a number of lines further. Now the next line is different. It starts out with a one, has a sequence of zeros, and then there are three ones in the middle, then the same sequence of zeros, and then one. 
So here is the black one at the periphery. Then here are the zeros. Next are the three black ones. And then there will be zeros and a black one there. And the remainder of this frame fills in like this. So we now see the picture is a black border and a kind of Maltese cross in the middle and everything else blank. There are many other layers, and when we build them all up, we result in a pattern, which we will shortly see, and that is the answer. We can tell this is the right answer because of how regular the geometry is. We couldn't have gotten that by accident. So here is, in three dimensions, what the resulting model is like. Now let's see what the graduate students have to say about uh, their interpretation of this funny looking message. Well, the first thing that came out of our analysis of that object was that in profile it was strongly reminiscent of Mickey Mouse. And in fact, it's still not clear whether it's the case. Or not. <laughs> and although we know that you have a sense of humor, <laughs> Mickey Mouse was not our idea of joke. So it had to be something else. The only thing it really looked like was a molecular orbital type drawing of a molecule. And the first one that came to my mind was formaldehyde. And Kathy is in fact right. This was intended to be a formaldehyde molecule, although it does look a little bit like Mickey Mouse, in which there is a carbon atom, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. Now, what could the significance of that be? Why go to all this trouble to simply say formaldehyde? And the answer is that formaldehyde has a radio frequency attached to it. And what all of this trouble is about is the message is saying, don't listen on this station. This isn't the station that's interesting. Listen on the formaldehyde station, and that's where the Encyclopedia Galactica will be. So as soon as we get that message quick, we turn the frequency of our radio telescope uh, to the formaldehyde frequency, continue to look at the same star we're looking at, and then hopefully get such a message. That's the general kind of idea. Notice that if we made a serious such search and succeeded the results would be inestimable. We will have ended the isolation of mankind from the rest of the universe forever. If we made a serious search and failed, we would have determined something of uniqueness, fragility, preciousness of human beings. And it seems to me either way we win. And there are signs in the United States, Canada, Soviet Union, perhaps other countries, that a serious search for radio signals civilizations on planets of other stars is about to begin. Now, one often comes upon some other ideas about extraterrestrial intelligence, namely, why go to all this trouble with radio telescopes when the extraterrestrials are already here? We sometimes hear such an idea. The ideas are often expressed in terms of unidentified flying objects and in terms of ancient astronauts. Now, there's nothing silly about being able to fly between the stars. We are already doing it, although at an extremely slow pace. And it's taking us uh, about 80,000 years to go from here to the nearest star with our present space vehicle. It's a little slow. But other civilizations more advanced than we might very well be able to, uh, to do it in much shorter periods of time. So maybe we are or have been visited. It's not ridiculous. On the other hand, it's such an important contention that we should demand only the most rigorous standards of evidence. And uh, my judgment is that on the ancient astronaut business, uh, what happens is people look at uh, big buildings constructed long ago and say, my goodness, I don't know how that big building was built. Probably people from somewhere else built it. Uh, yes, maybe from Egypt, but not from some other star. The these ideas often show an ignorance of archaeology. Our ancestors were smart. They could build big. There is no artifact in early, earlier human history, so far as I know, which requires extraterrestrial intervention. Likewise, on unidentified flying objects, there are things seen in the sky which are unidentified. That's what an unidentified flying object is. It means we don't know what it is. It doesn't mean that it's a space vehicle from somewhere else. 
And there ought to be things in the sky that we don't understand.